No, don't, don't worry, because it actually raises something we're going to talk about later, which is the, the good, bad and ugly of um, the digital technology and how people are dealing with that in, in all of this. Um, so um, just getting back into the swing of that. Um, <laughs> um, yes. So, um, yeah, we just wanted to give our thoughts out to people who are involved in, you know, in the lockdown out in a lot of different places and to the Indigenous organisations um, who are helping communities and residents um, through this process. Um, what we're going to talk to you about today is part of a larger research project that um, CAPA and the Governance Institute are um, carrying out in collaboration together, a two-year project, um, and it's about the Indigenous governance of development, and we're looking at the self-determined strategies and solutions that Indigenous groups and communities are implementing across the country. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the case studies that we were going to do as part of that research um, was what we called the Elders Organisation Survey, the elder organisations being um, over 900 really long established Indigenous organisations in Australia. And we wanted to see um, what was happening in their adaptive governance over their long life cycle. But of course, what happened was COVID hit and we realised what we really needed to do first off was to try and understand how organisations were adapting their governance during the project, during the, um, the pandemic. So I'm going to just now do another bit of tech and share my screen so that we can um, all start having a look at the, what we're bringing to you today. Um, so I'm assuming that's all up and okay for everyone because I can see it okay. Um, yeah, so then COVID hit. And so today what we want to do is give you um, some of our findings from the work um, that we've been doing last uh, year and continuing in this year. And in particular, um, with several organisations, um, what was extraordinary was that we sent out an online survey and in the middle of the pandemic, we actually got responses from people. So I think that in itself is indicative of um, organisational capacity. Um, not only did people reply to an online monkey survey where we asked questions of them, but some of them foolishly ticked the box and said they'd be happy for us to um, call them back and have a yarn with them. And these organisations that you can see listed here are ones who additionally um, made their time available really generously <clears throat> to have chats with us that sometimes went for an hour, two hours on Zoom. Um, so a big thank you to all of these organisations and their general managers and CEOs. And um, just before we kickstart into the rest of the presentation, I'd also like to thank um, PAPA and the Governance Institute for their ongoing support of this project um, during what's been challenging times as well for research governance um, in the middle of a pandemic. So we'd just like to um, acknowledge that ongoing support. Um, give a big shout out as well to everyone from the Governance Institute in the Brisbane office who are all watching in to say um, hello and give their support. And um, to any Governance Institute board members who are also um, joining us today, welcome. So just to um, go back, let's take us back to the beginning of the pandemic last year um, in End of January, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern in terms of COVID-19. Um, and there was considerable fear back then, if you all remember, um, right at the very start about the impact of this virus, virus on indigenous communities, uh, for very good reasons, given um, the history of poor health status and the impact of previous um, epidemics. And several leaders immediately um, and loudly raised their concern for um, Aboriginal communities. Pat Turner, Turner was noting that there'd be absolute devastation if it got into especially Aboriginal communities and remote and rural ones. And John Pettison, who was the CEO of the um, Northern Territory Aboriginal Medical Services, um, I think highlighted at that stage, which was a really big um, problem for a lot of communities as, as well as everyone else in Australia, which was the lack of clear and consistent and appropriate responses um, from governments 
Um, and he was highlighting the lack of information and responses that was tailored to Indigenous um, people. And then what happened was that in um, early March, Fu declared a pandemic. Um, at that stage, the states were already um, going entirely their own way. It was a bit like trying to herd cats, I think. Um, prompting one public commentator in March of last year to note that Australian federalism in the context of the pandemic was, quote, one nation with six governments, um, which sounds familiar, doesn't it? And yet today, probably for the first time in Australian settler colonial history, it appears that Indigenous health outcomes are actually um, noticeably better for the COVID pandemic than those for the rest of Australia. Um, there are only 149 positive Indigenous cases as at the beginning of this year. 113 of those were hospitalised and there was not one death of an Indigenous person. So when you look at the data, it looked like a major health disaster for communities in Australia appears to have been averted. And so early last year, um, we asked ourselves the question, in the context of considerable anxiety, um, what is it that Aboriginal organisations, Torres Strait Islander organisations might be doing? How are they contributing to effectively governing the impacts of the pandemic in their community? The one thing, if you remember back at that time into sort of February and March and April, was that many communities and their organisations simply stopped waiting for governments to act and they started making and implementing their own decisions. In fact, they started governing the pandemic. And one of the earliest examples of that um, came out of Cape York with uh, Mapoon um, Aboriginal community and their Aboriginal Shire Council where they implemented a much publicised lockdown of their own. This is before any other lockdowns were happening around the country. And just to note how quickly they acted, that was just 12 days after the World Health Organisation um, declared the pandemic. Now, Nassim Chetty, the Aboriginal CEO of Mapoon, uh, Mapoon um, explained their decision in the following way. And she was interviewed in national and inter international um, news. Um, she said, quote, we needed to be proactive. We shouldn't be waiting for COVID-19 to be in our community. We need to shut it at our doorstep. We don't want to regret that we could have done this. When you think about life, I think it's more important to be proactive rather than reactive. One of the um, members of the Aboriginal um, Cape York Health Council at the time called that decision decisive, um, based on strong evidence and strong capacity locally and cutting through all the bureaucracy. So that motivated us to begin um, initially uh, what we thought was just going to be a fairly simple, straightforward um, survey. And I'll now pass over to Lara, just to take us through um, how we did that online survey. Thanks, Di. Um, so the aim of our survey was to explore how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations were adapting their governance and operations during the pandemic. And we were looking at were there commonalities and also what factors allowed them to be adaptive. In particular, we were also interested in practical strategies that could be shared with other organisations to support their crisis management approach. So our sample evolved over time. Um, Dale, Di and I were working, as I mentioned, together on the Elders Organisation project, looking at how long established organisations navigate crisis, challenges and change. So we planned to contact a small group of organisations that met the Elders criteria, meaning that they had been operating for more than 20 years um, and that were also representative of different sizes, industries and locations, such as state and territories, remote, rural, urban, Torres Strait and mainland. Um, we were looking for these organisations from past finalists of the Indigenous Governance Awards program. 
The awards were established by Reconciliation Australia and the BHP Foundation to celebrate examples of successful governance in Indigenous organisations around the country. And AIGI is now a co-host of the awards program. But through internal project um, meeting discussions, we realised that we were unnecessarily limiting the scope by focusing solely on elder organisations and finalists from the awards program. And that really all organisations were facing a crisis through COVID and having to be innovative, creative and adaptive. So we expanded the sample to incorporate, um, to include, sorry, all incorporated awards participants. And our method was very COVID sensitive and informed by the constraints and realities of COVID. So it really obviously wasn't feasible for us to travel or meet with people face to face. So we created an online survey through SurveyMonkey and then we held follow up chats via Zoom. Okay, so a bit more information about the survey and the Zooms. Um, the survey was divided into six topics, which were about the organisation, background information about the board, how they adapted to challenges, building on strengths, helpful resources and looking to the future. There were 34 questions in total, which we now recognise was definitely too long. And this is a learning which will inform how we design our next survey for the Elder Organisations Project. Um, the, first, the very first question on the survey was consent to participate and the survey automatically closed um, and didn't allow them to continue if a participant selected no to consent. We piloted our draft questions with the AIGI staff um, internally, and then we revised all the questions to improve their relevance and clarity based on feedback we received. We chose a combination of question types to obtain both quantitative and qualitative information, and also to try and enhance participant responsiveness. And the, the focus was on governance, obviously, but Based on our view that governance is a practice that runs right through an organisation, not something that sits simply right at the top. So people from both the board and executive level were encouraged to participate. In terms of distribution, we sent direct emails to 294 organisations who were participants from the awards program. And then we also promoted it at um, a governance conference and widely through AIGI networks. However, we actually only got responses back from the direct emails. So our survey went live in October, 2020. And initially we planned to have it open for three months, but we ended up extending it for an additional two because of feedback we received from people that by the end of 2020, they just didn't have the headspace or capacity to engage. The survey was accessed and attempted 43 times but only 30 of those were actually completed surveys. So we excluded the incomplete surveys from our analysis. And so the 30 completed equals a 10% return rate, which we've been told is a pretty standard um, amount. So as you can see, um, 30 is a very small study, but it is one of the few to quantitatively and qualitatively capture the experiences of Indigenous organisations during the pandemic in Australia. In the survey, we asked people if they would be interested in a follow-up chat to discuss their responses in more depth, and 16 um, agreed to that. And we were able to coordinate um, Zoom chats with nine of them. So it was all um, CA, CEOs who were able to participate. And again, I'd just like to reiterate what Di said, that um, everyone was incredibly generous with both their time and their insights um, as the interviews went for between one to two hours. So the Zooms followed a semi-structured format, which was informed by their survey responses and also our review of information that was publicly available on their websites about their responses to COVID-19. And we did organise written consent um, to participate and to record the Zooms prior to holding them. And we're currently in the process of turning those recordings into written transcripts using the otter.ai software and just sending them back to participants for edits and for um, their final approval. Okay, so what did we find? Well, um, to start with, what were the biggest challenges from COVID-19? 
So in the survey, organisations were presented with a list of challenges and asked to rate whether they had a small, medium or big impact on their governance. And then they were also provided a separate list of challenges, some which overlapped and some which differed, and asked to rate their level of impact on their operations. And what we found was actually the top three challenges rated as having a big impact were exactly the same for both governance and operations. And so that was firstly being unable to meet face to face, uh, secondly, higher workloads, and thirdly, difficulties in planning. So the fourth challenge we have on the slide, stress, fear, and anxiety. Interestingly, it wasn't rated as a big impact in the survey. However, it was frequently raised and discussed in the Zoom conversations. Um, and our approach is to integrate findings from both. Um, so we've included in, in our list of biggest challenges. Okay, so what did the organizations do? Well, their activities fell into these three areas, supporting their community, adapting their governance and pivoting their operations. And the following slides in our presentation today will explore how organizations did this and share some examples from our Zoom chats. So first off is supporting their community. We found that um, cultural values really underpinned and guided organizational priorities during the pandemic. Common priorities that were discussed in the survey were um, protecting the health of elders and vulnerable people, promoting family and community connection, supporting clients and members' needs, and providing appropriate and safe services. And many organisations actually took on additional roles to support their people and community throughout COVID-19. And this included activities that were outside the regular scope and which they weren't necessarily resourced to deliver. So there were three main areas of community support. Communication centered on sharing information about COVID-19. Organizations were really invested in creating their own resources and 47% of them actually translated information into language or into multimedia formats to increase its relevance to their audience. Communication was also strongly linked to the challenge of addressing fear yeah. and anxiety. Um, a key role of leadership was to reassure people, address their concerns and to correct misinformation. Trust was in an important part of this and two thirds of organisations rated their board members' relationships out in communities as a really helpful strength. Essential needs was about organised food or essential items for those in need and also connecting people up to other organisations that provided critical services. Wellbeing went beyond caring for people's physical health and safety. Organisations also provided or linked people to mental health support and had a range of initiatives to encourage some form of um, social interaction via phone calls or social distance spaces to um, isolation. Um, so I'll pass it back to some examples of how organisations supported their community. Thanks, Lara. <clears throat> and um, just for those of you who have still got their um, video open, if you can um, close your um, your actual video, um, it might help us in the again in the, in the technology of um, of carrying the number of people who are watching in. It just makes it a bit easier because we want to show you a bit later on a video as well. So as Lara said, what we uh, what we want to do is try and integrate the survey results within the more in depth conversations that we had um, with people in organisations. Um, and one of the most important, the very first things um, that Lara mentioned um, organisations doing was um, tackling the issue of getting information out in an accurate and meaningful way in um, local contexts. And this is an example from the Aboriginal Health Council in WA of one of their very early posters um, where they basically took the messages from, um, from the health experts, that lovely phrase that we keep hearing all the time, they translated that um, information into local conditions and circumstances and visuals in order to get the messages across to people. 
Um, and I, I think this is one of the fantastic examples of, you know, like no card games, no pickup bumpers and smokes. Um, so really tailored um, living conditions and close social relationships in communities. Now, what we're going to try and do, and hopefully it'll work and hopefully the sound is um, okay, Lara was talking about um, organisations really quickly translating um, the complex information, not just into visuals, but into language. And this was one of the very first, um, and you'll be able to see that by the, the updatedness of um, information that was contained in this. Um, it was created by um, Purple House from Central Australia, who's one of the Governance Institute's um, awards uh, finalists from a few years back. Um, so I'll just start playing to you. It's very short um, and in language with subtitles. Hey, could you just increase the sound volume, please? Di, you actually need to take yourself off mute so that we can hear this slideshow. Uh, did you not hear any of that? Will I take it back? No, we couldn't hear it. Okay. Let's see how this goes. Is that okay? No, it's still not coming through. Maybe if you change the audio setting um, that we found yesterday. I, I think it's actually the, um, when you share your screen, there's a, there's a, I think there's something there where you say share the sound as well um, when you initially share the screen. And if you don't do that, it doesn't come through. Okay. I've just shared screen and shared sound. So let's see. Yeah, that's it. Mindangapalunya, <laughs> Kuari, pika baluru, ngajalpi, nganapa ngurang kalpi, pampurnu balu astra jalpi. Hilat hilat oh, cinto kuju ba kuju bangka, yandang ojuta pika balunya mencini ya, karena virus balunya. Nganana na riri ringkola, cukro ringkola, kulin jago, patan jago, purnu balu pika kuya balu pampul bang barang nganapa ngura. Yandang ungu pika balunya karena virus balunya, markolku alaji balunya palyara. Mara Palchi la nyundo pa su panga kapinga. Mara nyundo pa Palchi la panya yuro nyundo pa nyundo mangari ngalkul kijango. Yanku kijango nyundo toli raguru. Mara Palchi la ila tela ko. Nyundo ku paringkula wita wani la nyundo parpa dongko nyundo pa Mara Palchi la. Nyundo ngayana ni warka ngoro o kula ngoro ngura koto. Wajja juta na chungu ring kijango. Mara nyundo pa Palchi la panya ngura koto ringkula. We are Hillary Jago Yarnango, Kojoba Kojoba Oro, Wan Mari, Yarnango Tangamara. We are Pampun Jago, Kojoba Naraja, Ilarinkola, Wan Mangara Mabalola. If you know Copa Rinkola, Yanga La Nyanduba, Copa Nara Balonia, Nico Nyundubango. Palola Moro, Polela, Nyanduba Mara Palchila. Carno Fares, Palomba, Kojob Kojob Mirichin, we are Narani. Nilang Darwia Wakara Palal Pay, Palaj. Kolila Matobra. Nyundu we are wanting Jacob, Nyundu Baflu, Needle, 
ลูกคนนี้ลับยังไงนี่ยี่ยังห่างกับมาตัวปราณยันโดอันกุลาวังกายันโดมันจีนจักรไม่ได้กินนะยันโดฟลูจะรารีกูพัลลุลังโอยันโดปังอาคาร์นฟาร์สปีการิน่าลิงโกโกลิลโกไม่กินปะริน่าลิงโกยันโดปะกับปัญญามีนดาริงโกละโคลินยันโดคุยะปาร์ปาร์โดริงอิมิลลาลันโดยาลเปนิกาโอชพิลังวาราจุดังโกโคลีลามาตัวปราคุยะยันคุณจักรงูราคุจูปะคุจูปะกรอสิทธิกรุ่ยยันคุณจักรโอ้งั้นนะบางอาจจะท้าวนุ่นนังอะไรนั่นแหละสปริงอะไรวันที่เรียลล่ะงูร่างกันยินนะโคจิงกันมาตัวปุระลิงก์นุ่นตัวงั้นยันจักรนุ่นตัวปัตตาเอลส์ไทมิกโอปัลลาคุณนุ่นตัวงั้นยันจักรนุ่นตัวปุตตาลกูปัญญาไทมินุ่นตัวงั้นยันจักรนุ่นตัวจารปัญญาโกไทเอลส์กูปัลลาปัลโลนุ่นตัวยามีนารินนังกูวิติลกูโคลีล่ะมาตัวปุระปัลลาญินนามะอัมปาร์กันนุ่นตัวปะมังงารีตาร์ปัลลาญังอัอะไรที่วัดใจนี่เป็นยังไงพลังกูวังกังกาเอลตีลิงกูนี่นั่งจักรูทรูงลิงกูนี่นั่งจักรูมาตัวปุระลิงกูวังกังกาจะโคลีล่ะอันนั้นคือเป็นตัวอย่างที่สวยงามของทางเพื่อนร่วมงานและนี่ไม่ใช่แค่ตัวอย่างของประเทศไทยที่ทำการเขียนภาษาอังกฤษและบางทีก็ใช้วิดีโอที่ใช้ทางการเขียนภาษาอังกฤษและบางทีก็ใช้ Um, using um, local translators and local Aboriginal video teams, and you can see that this was out well before there was even any understanding that we might be able to get a vaccination happening. Um, but very strong, clear messages. Um, it's safer out bush, and um, the ways that people could actually help each other in terms of hygiene. Another. Um, example of um, the community outreach um, that organizations were doing around the countryside. I think um, another really um, interesting example comes from um, the Kimberleys in Western Australia um, with CALAC, the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre. And, and back in those early um, several first months of the pandemic, remember there was a lot of discussion about trying to get um, Aboriginal people who are in towns back out to their own home communities. Um, what that meant for a very small community in um, the Kimberleys, um, Balgo, was that um, about 50 Aboriginal people from around the Kimberleys and as far away as Perth were repatriated back to the community. Um, and that it's a small community, so 50 additional people is um, a big a big incoming um, number. At the same time, there were a group of Walpuri doing business out in the desert when they heard about the lockdown and the virus um, and its impacts in terms of quarantine, they immediately headed into Balgo, which was the nearest community to them. The influx of um, people in Balgo put huge pressures on um, overcrowding in housing, on food security, high risks of transmission, And there was a lot of concern um, by CALAC and by the Belgo Council um, for the health and safety, especially of elders. So leaders in Belgo and um, in conjunction with CALAC went on um, into action and um, decided to reactivate a number of the smaller outstations around Belgo into what they called arcs or safe spaces that elders could Um, take themselves away from Balgo, lessen the overcrowding and move back out further onto country. But a number of those outstations really didn't have um, essential amenities, kitchens and um, water supply. So in the midst of the pandemic, um, Pallet just reached out across Western Australia and activated partnerships, one successfully with Bunnings. Um, and Bunnings donated uh, generators and building equipment Um, that was basically transported up to the community um, in order to try and progress the work on those outstations. Another um, example of um, really swinging into action and um, in a collaborative way comes from uh, Geraldton, from the Bandiara um, organisation. Um, in the early phase of the pandemic, um, Bandiara coordinated and joined forces with the Midwest Employment and Economic Development Aboriginal Corporation, with the Geraldton Aboriginal Streetwork Corporation and the Aboriginal Biodiversity Conservation Foundation 
for the purposes of pulling together um, emergency relief packages um, that had cleaning and sanitary products and food, um, initially to people in the town who um, were really struggling in terms of food and the kinds of equipment that they needed to stay safe. They um, extended that service very, very quickly. Um, Bandiara's manager of operations, Wayne McDonald, who's on the left of this um, photo here, said, and I quote, we had calls from Aboriginal people in critical need, people in lockdown where there are no shops, they're not allowed to leave their communities, and they're running low on cleaning products, on hygiene needs and food. So everyone pulls together to get food and essentials out to all our mobs in the region. Now, what that simple sentence of, you know, we pulled together to get the essentials out to our mob meant was that they partnered with Woolies and Coles in Geraldton. They got um, huge, as you can see, um, loads of um, food from those massive suppliers, picked them up, repackaged them, put them into their own um, refrigerated trucks and took out on a 700 kilometre round trip every fortnight food packages to people in communities. Now, in addition to that, um, Bandiara also then linked in, there was an existing um, alliance in Geraldton called the Yamaji um, Regional Alliance with about 25 Aboriginal groups who worked together and got together every couple of months to talk about how things are going in the community, in the town. They activated and mobilised that during the pan pandemic and created a pandemic coordination management group. All of those organisations met regularly, usually every week to two weeks. They kept minuted notes of their discussions and their decisions and their actions, and they linked immediately and directly into government and into industry, providing advice um, from the remote areas into governments about a range of issues like food security, housing, um, social isolation, stress and suicide in communities. They provided options on fly in, fly out arrangements and solutions for mining companies. They discussed the quarantine boundaries with government and also um, newly arising funding issues for communities. Another aspect of um, the work that organisations did in reaching out um, was the issue of community residents' mental health. Um, and there was, um, this was an area of um, use of the digital technology where people increasingly use that as a way of looking after um, their clients and community residents. And um, organisations across the country were making enormous efforts in, in this way. Um, in one sector, which we often don't hear a lot, there were some really interesting um, innovations made, um, and that's the arts and theatre sector. And um, in our discussions with um, Yuri Akin, they were doing some really exciting things to try and um, pull together the Aboriginal artists in the city who were all in quarantine, couldn't come out of their houses. How can we actually encourage and support their creative endeavours. And um, Peter Swift um, from Yuriakin was um, noting that that's one of the, it was one of the critical concerns of the organisation. So they did some repurposing of funds with their partners and set up a series of online support for everyone, which included not just online meetings with artists individually, they got some new projects up and going for them. One of which was a play club, not a Sesame Street play club, but an actual performance play where people could go online together and read out the scripts that they were developing for plays to each other and get feedback. Um, and that's just, I think, to highlight um, something that was going on across the country in a really effective way was of people reaching out to each other, not just in terms of the Zoom, but social media to support each other in these ways. So as Di just demonstrated, organisations were coordinated with their contacts and partners to develop ways to support their clients, members and the wider community. The survey showed us that organisations also shared their resources um, as well as their strategies for operating in a COVID-19 world with each other. <laughs> 
and good relationships with local government, service providers, organisations and community leaders were reported as a cultural strength. Further, organisations explained that these relationships provided them not only with advice, but also with a shoulder to lean on, mutual understanding and an allied front on issues. I'll pass back to Di to talk a little more about this. Um, I think one of the points coming out here from some of the examples and, and what Laura was drawing out from the, from the survey is that Indigenous organisations are not social or cultural isolates. They're thickly integrated into the wider networked webs of their member communities, groups and families, and the kinship relationships that are involved in that. And whilst that's not um, a new insight, um, in fact, um, I think that the thing that is a new insight is that often that very embeddedness is portrayed negatively by governments and public media. Um, and indeed, it can present challenges to Indigenous organisations that they talk about themselves. But in the case of the pandemic, the substantial benefits for organisations being embedded in this relationality became so much clearer. It meant that they were, first of all, quickly able to assess the extent of different Aboriginal needs and of the different stresses and potential impacts. And because of their local knowledge, they were able to realistically assess risk and potential impacts. What that meant was that, that they were able to design customised solutions and take action very quickly. Um, it also, I think, enabled them to um, avoid um, what you often see in large institutions and the bureaucracy, which increasingly these days is a risk paralysis. Um, organisations, Indigenous organisations did not, the ones that we've talked to, and so they did not seem to suffer risk paralysis and analysis. They actually were able to take action very quickly because of their embeddedness. Okay, so this slide presents the many ways that um, organisations adapted their governance to be functional during the pandemic. So two thirds of organisations introduced strategies to facilitate internal communication within the board and also between the CEO and the board. Predominantly, this was increased frequency of phone calls, emails and meetings between the CEO and board to provide updates on COVID-19 related developments. 83% of organisations rated a strong relationship between the CEO and board as a very helpful strength. And this was actually the most highly rated strength out of 14 drop down options in the survey. Two thirds of organisations moved to virtual meetings. This included a mixture of teleconference, video conference and hybrid, meaning that some directors attended in person while others joined via Zoom. Organisations quickly implemented board endorsed COVID-19 response plans and policies. It worked best for those who preemptively had a crisis management plan in place to kickstart the process. Um, as one participant explained, it helped them to reduce the level of chaos as roles, responsibilities and the chain of command were clearly defined for them already. Organisations also streamlined their board matters and reporting to avoid information overload and to focus on the crisis at hand. This usually involved postponing strategic planning and general business to prioritise pandemic related issues. Um, for example, the status of COVID-19 in their state of territory, updates on their organisational response, employee health and safety or funding. Several organisations found appointing an interim executive subcommittee was a really effective way to maintain governance and decision making throughout the crisis. So these committees usually comprised of the board chair, the CEO and of other senior executives. So it meant that decisions could be made on urgent matters out of session and then the board provided with a full update at their subsequent meeting. Some other organisations use circulating resolutions to achieve the same thing. Two thirds of organisations rated an, um, a united organisational vision as a very helpful strength. Focusing on their purpose, goals and values helped to guide organisations when making changes or plans in response to the crisis 
And it also helped them to feel more confident in the decisions that they made. So next, I will share some examples of adaptive governance from our interviews. Yeah, so just um, some examples of how those um, issues played out on the, um, the ground. One of the things that really loomed large um, during the pandemic and, and won't um, go away, I don't think, is, is what we call e-governance, um, how people are actually using technology um, in terms of governing their organisation to be able to do the job that they want to do. Um, we found it really particularly interesting. There's some interesting examples about um, the way um, CEOs and general managers worked with their boards and chairs of boards over this time and used um, uh, technology. In particular, you know, we all had to get to grips with Zoom as we have had today. Um, and uh, one uh, CEO noted that it was an advantage being able to use Zoom during the pandemic for the board and committee because at times when board members were either in lockdown, social isolation, or even if they weren't, were very reluctant to travel long distances away from home, then it meant that they were able to achieve the board meeting, get through business, um, the papers were able to go up online, they could share data and information, um, and in some instances, it meant that the chair of the meeting was able to run things more effectively and actually have the meeting happen a bit quicker. Um, another example given by a very small organisation with a small um, membership was that um, being able to use Zoom in that way with um, dispersed board members meant that it, they probably had the best attended AGM um, that they've had in a long time via Zoom. So people were able to make um, novel and timely changes as a route to their governing and operational services and redeploy staff and resources at short notice um, and also justify those changes as not only being necessary but having um, a base in cultural integrity and for the good of um, community members. Um, and it extended beyond um, the board, the use of technology, um, one of uh, the people that we spoke to in the organisations um, pointed out how important it, the Zoom was to be able to actually link in and have regular meetings still with quite important um, committees that organisation had, in particular its financial um, advisory committee, and basically noting that because they were able to do that via Zoom, it meant that they were able to keep an eye on um, things as they were developing, anything that affected the financial bottom line of the organisation they were able to get on top of very quickly. So many organisations introduced or greatly accelerated their use of new communications um, apps and technology. One of the things I think um, that's quite interesting in terms of the way people um, reshaped or pivoted, as Lara likes to say, um, the relationship um, between board chairs and CEOs was, I think there was, a, a, people were starting to develop and still have a slightly different way of working together. Um, so CEOs, general managers and the chairs of boards were really having regular um, weekly, sometimes daily conversations that went beyond the um, mantra of Western governance of the separation of powers. You know, you're not, you, you shouldn't really be stepping over the line of the roles and responsibilities. During the pandemic, we noticed that there was a much more braided, woven mode of decision-making that was happening together between general managers, CEOs and chairs on a much more frequent basis. Um, and establishing, as Lara was saying, um, subcommittees, they became in effect hubs for crisis management. And one of the interesting characteristics of those hubs was that rather than following the pipeline structure of most organisations in terms of chain of command, a number of those hubs actually extended across distributed decision making across the structural divisions of board management and senior staff and often um, other staff in order to be able to get decisions made and then mobilise them very um, quickly. So they got rid of um, a a lot of the hierarchy associated with more structured organisations. 
but it's not all um, good news. And some interesting information that Lara will talk to us about came out about the downsides of e-governance. Yeah, so um, what came out of the survey was that organisations held quite varied views actually about the efficacy of um, face-to-face meetings versus virtual board meetings. Mm -hmm. So for some, it showed that their board could be just as effective in virtual meetings as face-to-face -face, and that in-person meetings aren't always required to get business done. And for some, it actually um, they actually discovered that there were governance advantages to meeting online, as I was saying, as more directors were able to attend by a video conference than had been the case prior to COVID. Um, and in those instances, it actually improved engagement and decision making. Um, however, others felt that nothing could effectively replace face to face and that virtual meetings pose challenges for maintaining good governance standards and also um, for cultural governance. In addition to that, um, some organisations experienced barriers that were just completely out of their control, such as non-existent mobile and internet reception or poor connectivity. Um, one organisation was explaining that the inferior IT network structure created serious delays in slowness regarding communication, decision-making and their approvals processes. Um, and another raised the point that effective communication via technology is a two-way street and that even though their um, organisation had set up really good capacity, they still had difficulty communicating with their clients because many of their clients had low technological skills, which meant um, limited ability to connect with them fully. Okay, so now we'll take a look at how um, organisations pivoted their operations and the way that they do business. Pivot is our buzzword, as I was alluding to. Um, so the survey found that organisations were able to really quickly adapt their operations and service delivery approach to comply with government directions and to create COVID safe environments for their staff, clients and the wider community. Organisations implemented a range of COVID-19 workplace protocols, such as providing hand sanitizer, additional cleaning rosters, purchasing PPE, marking 1.5 metres distance on the floor, training their staff on ways to minimise the spread or infection, um, or having their vulnerable staff work from home. A transition to digital service delivery was the most frequently reported way that organisations adapted to the challenges of COVID-19. Um, the opportunity to adapt, however, was in part limited by whether the organisation's mission or activities had any relevance in a digital format, which was not the case for everyone. 57% of organisations had to introduce new technology or expand their capacity and frequency of use of existing um, to enable their staff and board to work remotely. They also provided them with IT training and support to help people adjust to conducting business more virtually and to strengthen their digital literacy. Um, However, 23% of organisations reported um, a strong investment in tech prior to COVID-19 and they didn't actually need to introduce anything further. The ones that already used online platforms to communicate and to collaborate on documents with their teams had a really easy transition to working from home and reported minimal disruption. Organisations tried to keep their staff feeling informed and valued by sharing frequent updates with them and hosting online catch-ups, check-ins and social activities. Those with high workloads rostered in breaks to prevent burnout. And many organisations provided access to employee assistance programs, wellbeing programs or mental health specialists to help their staff cope with the additional stress, anxiety and pressure. How an organisation reprioritised their activities and staffing was quite context specific. So those with a high demand delayed their non-critical work and those who couldn't undertake their regular activities developed work plans and strategies for longer term goals that could be progressed in the present regardless of COVID-19. And the same dichotomy happened with staffing. 
So some organisations had to reduce the number of staff or their hours of work, while others actually didn't have enough staff to keep up with their increased workload and were looking to recruit or to restructure their team to make up for this. Organisations up their engagement with their members, clients and community. Strategies included creating or increasing their social media presence, updating their website, making phone calls, providing online resources, distributing regular service updates or holding more community meetings. Organisations proactively addressed funding issues. 43% accessed the JobKeeper scheme, uh, several of which expressed gratitude, saying that the payments enabled them to keep staff employed and the doors open. Organisations also negotiated solutions with their funding bodies, collaborated with their partners to strengthen collective capability, restructured their teams, revised budgets, applied for other government grants or incentives, and accessed community emergency brokerage. In the end, only four organisations rated funding problems as having a big impact, but it's not quite clear whether the majority of respondents um, rated it as a small impact because the above strategies were so effective or because they had um, minimal impact to start with regarding funding problems. Some organisations reported an overload of information about government programs, which created confusion and uncertainty. So to quote one participant, there was too much information floating around about COVID and support packages. And I feel we missed out on opportunities because there was too much information and just not enough time to digest it all. Organisations also had a mixed experience with ORIC and their newly introduced COVID-19 special rules. So some described ORIC as very helpful a good source of resources and the COVID-19 special rules as being useful. One organisation, however, felt that the special rules ignored cultural governance considerations and that ORIC didn't really account for the logistical and technological barriers that exist in some remote communities um, when approving a request to postpone meetings. So I'll pass it back to Daya to talk about the implications of our findings. Thanks, Lara. Um, there are many um, practice implications and lessons that are coming out of uh, um, the work, and we're currently writing up um, a paper to, to present those in, in considerable detail. But Lara and I thought it would be best to focus this on sort of how can we actually try and understand a bit better the contributions that organisations were um, able to make. Um, and what are the um, policy implications of that? Um, so obviously, again, for us, the analysis leads to us to conclude that organisations um, have made a significant positive contribution to the health and general well-being of their community members and clients, but not only that, also to the health and well-being of their staff and board members over a really sustained period. Um, in this, um, we see organisations as acting as adaptive agents, strategically assessing and reshaping their governance and operational areas to deliver critical outcomes in a really timely way during the crisis. Now, this is not to diminish the really obvious difficulties and significant stresses experienced um, by Aboriginal communities and by many organisations during the pandemic, Rather, it's um, to note that in the midst of those dire fears and challenges, that many Indigenous organisations were able to marshal a very Indigenous capability for adaptive self-determination and to quite positive effect. So we want to just talk very quickly about this concept of adaptive capabilities and its link to self-determination. By adaptive capability, we mean an organisation's overall systemic ability to recognise and adjust to risk and harm in a productive way. Um, but it's more than simply the sum of the individuals in the organisation or the different structural units of an organisation. Um, it's a whole of organisation ability. Doesn't, that doesn't sound all that kind of, you know, 
dramatic, but when you think about capabilities and the research done to date, it often focuses on the role of individuals. Um, slowly, people are starting to talk about collective capabilities. I think what we're um, concluding from this work is that organisations have a collective capability set um, and that for Indigenous organisations, self-determination lies at the heart of that collective capability. And it's when we think about self-determination, we often hear it more spoken about in the context of being a right. Um, what we saw in these organisations during the pandemic was that self-determination is a culturally situated practice, a way of actually doing things day to day, not some um, future right or future way of doing things. Not only that, um, adaptive self-determination is also operating in an intercultural field of relationships. And so we saw organisations absolutely mobilising and harnessing their partnerships and their relationships out with government and out with industry. So uh, the combination of this adaptive capability um, combines to form what we call a cultural capital for action by um, organisations. And we want to pose this um, concept or term of adaptive self-determination um, because we think it helps us understand uh, the wide range of things that people were doing and how they were doing it. And we define adaptive self-determination as this collective um, capability of the organisations who were freely determined, autonomously exercising power, taking responsibility for decision-making in times of crisis and high risk, that then enables them to take agile action, to modify their governing and operational arrangements in strategic novel ways, but especially in contexts when the evidence is unclear and often contradictory. Um, another thing that we note is that this adaptive self-determination capability is not a new thing in Indigenous organisations. In fact, you could argue it's always been there. Um, it's often portrayed more negatively um, but what we're suggesting is that um, organisations have always had to be inventive, inventive and adaptable, what Leah Armstrong several years ago called restless renewal. And what the pandemic has done is to spotlight an existing capability set and the role it plays in organisations being able to be flexible and agile in crisis contexts. So just to conclude, we'll just um, raise for further discussion with you um, what we think are some of the policy implications. They're bound to be um, more than these, but some of the big things that, um, that we've been thinking about are um, the issue of e-governance and data um, governance. Um, as Lara said, there, um, there were advantages and benefits to this, but it also um, highlighted real deficits in terms of suitable IT and access and infrastructure. It suggests in terms of policy consideration that there needs to be a national Indigenous digital strategy with funding. Um, this issue is now going to increase. It's not going to go away. Um, as Deidre pointed out a couple of weeks ago and in her workshop last week, organisations are delivering services plus. Um, organisations during the pandemic are uh, using their networks to unlock kinds of resources, knowledge, human and cultural capital that otherwise wouldn't be available from government industry and partners. In other words, they're providing something unique and valuable. And to that extent, um, that contribution that comes from that capability set really needs to be incorporated in stable long-term funding arrangements. And um, our final set of um, policy implications, um, cultural values and relationships were actually a real strength, a form of cultural capital. And that I think um, can really need to be acknowledged and reflected more in contemporary policy implications rather than seeing those things as again, as being deficits for governance. Um, over the years recently, when outstations and small communities have suffered under increasingly restrictive government funding, and in some states, the attempt to close down small communities, the COVID pandemic has clearly demonstrated that outstation and remoteness have positive survival 
value. I think that's a very strong policy message. And that um, community-based organisations, regional organisations, not just the national peaks, have an ongoing critical role in not just governing the pandemic, because we're now seeing Delta variant in places, um, but also in future recovery. And as um, Wayne McDonald was saying in terms of the work that they're doing in um, Geraldton uh, region, um, and this applies to the whole of Australia, we can do more and wish to be further involved and considered a vital link in the delivery of government COVID response actions and activities in the Gascoigne and Murchison. We need government to work with us, not without us, involving us directly in finding solutions. And I think our research, um, perhaps what we'd come out and say at the end of that research is that organisations are coming up with really innovative solutions that government um, and industry mightn't otherwise come up with themselves. So there's considerable um, benefit and value to the wider community in, um, in actually working very closely in the future with organisations during the COVID pandemic. And thank you very much.